Uh, okay, good morning, good evening. My question is, uh, what do you think about what, what do you think are the most pressing concerns and or responsibilities of Buddhist studies scholars? If you were to design a Buddhist studies program, what would this curriculum look like? And what should we be addressing and teaching in our university courses? Okay, well, first of all, um, I express my um, it, um, gratitude and it's a very big honor for me to be speaking to you. Um, as uh, you may uh, notice, I put a very high regard uh, and I really value uh, the academic uh, studies. Uh, both in the traditional setting and also in the um, academic world uh, beyond sort of the traditional uh, Tibetan, whatever, Himalayan uh, traditional setting. Because I think um, as uh, we always hear that um, when you enter um, especially Buddha Dharma, hearing and contemplation is almost like the uh, indispensable foundation. And uh, I, I believe that this uh, is what happens uh, in the Shedra situation and therefore in the academic world. Um, now, um, what you, the question you just put me, this is a very big question for me. I don't know how I'm going to answer this. Hopefully we will actually um, maybe discuss. I think this actually requires a lot of discussion. It's big because um, historically I feel that it's sort of unfortunate that uh, Buddhism got categorized into some sort of a religion. And um, now I know that there's always uh, this kind of statement like Buddhism is not a religion, Buddhism is a philosophy, Buddhism is science, so on and so forth. But um, uh, I'm actually speaking in a very, very um, kind of a, uh, in many sort of different aspects uh, when it comes to language and when it comes to custom, uh, tradition, therefore. Um, so all this, I mean, even like, uh, let's choose a language, for instance. Um, now, um, even the words like nirvana, for instance, um, how we, we, we are translating this word, how we are approaching this word, um, this need to be really analyzed and this need to really go deep. Um, I think because the Western academic system Really, um, even though it has a lot of its flaw, uh, it, it really uh, has the, the promise of um, kind of analyze, analyze the, the tradition of analyzing uh, open attitude, you know, I don't know. Mm. So I think um, like, uh, how should I put it? How, okay. So see, even um, like when people look at me, okay, so they see me as a Buddhist, a practicing Buddhist. So what are you looking for, right? What are you aiming for? What is your goal? Then of course, 
the standard classic answer is I'm looking for enlightenment, nirvana, whatever. Mm. And uh, of course, forget like um, countries that has no Buddhist background, even within the traditional Buddhist society, now the idea of the samsara, idea of liberation has become something very religious, something very, um, yeah, something very, okay, spiritual. And here again, even the word spiritual, many times I, I, I wonder whether Buddhism is even what we term spiritual, because I think when I'm looking at uh, the meaning of the word spiritual, and when I think about Buddhism in general, I don't know how much is this misleading, you know? So for instance, if you're looking at like a Kanjur, the classic Buddhist uh, sutra text, many times you will notice like, oh, so-and-so when she or he went to meet Buddha, and then after encountering the Buddha and after the bit of a discussion, so-and-so has Demba Thong. Demba Thong means he or she has seen the truth. See, so I would have really liked the people really see it this way. Now there's, of course, you know, the traditional Buddhist societies like the Tibetan or the Nepali or the Bhutanese, of course, there is that seemingly very religious rituals like a incense, the shrine. Anyway, so um, I don't know. I It would be really good even if um, you guys can study how Dharma actually came to the West. It would be really interesting something you know, how it, re, you know, the history of Buddhism. Um, I think history is quite important. Language, study of language is important. History of um, how Buddhism actually came. Um, you know, like even between, you know, uh, like how Buddhism went to China, because China is a very, very sophisticated country and they have a very, very sophisticated sort of system and thinking like Taoism, for instance. So that will, that ha has influence language wise, the way people understand, way people, you know, interpret. Uh, just like that, when, uh, when Buddhism came to West in many different ways. Uh, okay, some, some maybe the immigrants have brought, uh, the, like in Australia's case, a lot of Chinese went there. And I was told that it was the Chinese who brought Buddhism first time. But uh, how did they bring as a sort of a Chinese, uh, you know, like a cultural thing or were, were there, philosophical uh, actual study and uh, you know practice these are the things that i think we it could help i feel and then as i was saying language uh, now if you are talking about um, just to answer the question um, i th i would say the main thing you know on top of language history um, of course, the main thing that uh, we should put emphasis is on the view, not meditation, not uh, action, not ethic, not, mora uh, not like morality, um, not the rituals, but the view, view of the uh, Sharvakayana, Mahayana, um, I don't know. I think that is something that may be uh, and not only the view, actually, yeah, this is probably more important, how the view is established. Recently, I was talking to um, some Advaita Hindu um, 
students. And you know how Advaita Vedanta, you know, there is a very, very, very similarity, especially <laughs> with the Tantric Buddhism. I mean, yeah, Bajariana. And uh, I, I was telling them probably one of the, there are pro probably few things that are different, but one major difference between the Advaita and uh, Buddhism is Buddhism has a quite a good, what we say in Tibetan, Tawa Tenlam, which means how the view is constructed and established, such as through the study of like a Madhyamika. But when we say study of a Madhyamika, we will be studying Vabhyashika, Sautrantika, and then, you know, Chittamata, and how, you know, through the argument and through the analysis, we come to the conclusion of the Madhyamika. So the establishment, how the view is formed, I think this is quite crucial. Probably this is something that you may not hear so much in, let's say, in, in Japan, for instance, like Japan, Zen Buddhism. So you go to a temple and then they, they may recite like Heart Sutra, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, everything is shunyata, everything is just your projection, which is fine. But I think it would be good if people can study about study how view is actually is now let's talk about uh, as a method to um, make a student or a disciple to understand the view so it is believed that let's say okay the buddha out of compassion he wants people to understand the truth. Now, um, because if you don't see the truth, you are bound by um, illusion. And you are looking at an illusion and think it's real. And this is the, what we call avidya, ignorance. And you, know, you are bound to be disappointed with that kind of misconception. But um, the way it is, it, way the truth is presented. So when we talk about presenting the truth, it depends on how the capacity of the student. So maybe the first thing you can really talk about is something that is quite obvious, something that is quite, uh, you know, you don't need too much philosophical argument. Let's say like, all compounded things are impermanent. So even in the Sharvakayana, you know, probably the first thing you will hear a lot is anicca. You know, everything is impermanent. Now this is a truth. Now then, once that is established, which is supposedly fairly easy to establish through logic and through empiricism, so to speak, then you bring the next truth, which is uh, that all dualist, uh, all the uh, sort of distinctions they, that came from dualistic uh, mind leads to dukkha, right? So anicca, dukkha. Now this is much more e difficult to establish, but um, uh, you know, something that you can do, so to speak, right? And then the anatta, I'm talking about the, uh, the Sharvakayana, like the standard, like if you go to Theravada, any Theravada teachings, I think they would teach you this. Um, so establish the truth, okay. So finally you want to, okay, so you want to teach the anatta, selflessness, which is the most difficult to establish because everybody, you know, that's like, you know, I'm here, you know, what do you mean by I'm not here? But all compounded things are impermanent. Yeah, fairly easy to understand, sort of fairly easy to accept. So, so there are teachers like um, who says that actually like anicca and dukkha, everything is impermanent. All emotions are uh, dukkha. 
Now, this two statement is Buddha's statement that he did not really meant it as an ultimate truth. That what he really wants to actually teach is the anatta. Because you see, the thing is, the anicca, the impermanent, and the anatta, the selflessness is a contradiction. Because when you talk about the anicca, impermanence, it does sound like there is something that gets imper that becomes impermanent. Whereas when you talk about anatta, there's nothing. Well, even nothing, and if you are talking about the Mahayana, then even nothing is non-existent, so on and so forth. So all the, you know, like statements like things are impermanent, things are all, you know, dukkha, all this is just so that uh, the, the Buddha can, um, Buddha made the truth chewable, sort of like digestible, so to speak. Right, so then you establish this way. Now, this is purely when a practitioner is being led to the truth. So, I guess that's, I guess we are talking about for a practitioner. Now, when it comes to academic studies, when we talk, when it comes to hearing and contemplation, then things get much more complicated. So, then I'm sure many of you have um, been, uh, you know, reading like a Vabiyashika, Chitta Mata school, you know, like then, uh, then all the way, well, since, uh, you know, as a Tibetan Buddhist uh, follower, I myself have been very much influenced by Prasangika Madhyamika. So there, I mean, uh, basically, all view is uh, wrong. It doesn't matter what view, all one is supposed to go beyond all the views. So then there's an extensive sort of academic study on how to establish this view. Some of this logic can be quite useful, I think, for the, you know, Western Buddhist um, academics, because I think, uh, because in the West, I think uh, analysis, analysis is, um, analyzing is cherished and the critical mind is cherished, but it's almost like um, they, are, they go from one analysis to a certain analyzing and then they some, somehow stop. So it's, it's almost like they learn to doubt, but they don't learn to doubt the doubt, so to speak. So I think this is where maybe studies such as Madhyamika, which is a really good study on how to establish the view, that could help, I think. Do people have some follow-up questions before we switch subjects? Or Rinpoche, do you have follow-up questions for us? Um, is there any uh, sort of project to, uh, you know, really, as I was saying earlier, um, uh, you know, students studying Buddhist history in general, uh, and uh, especially in the West, how Buddhism came to the West, so to speak. Because, okay, I will give you one example. For instance, like a reincarnation is one very big touchy subject. So much so that even the traditional Buddhists, such as uh, Zen Buddhists, they rather not talk about it because they almost feel that reincarnation is the like sort of the weak point of Buddhism. But this is where I feel that uh, proper view is not established. I mean, forget reincarnation. Even nirvana is only asserted, especially in the Madhyamika, even nirvana, you know, it, it, the Buddha himself said, Nyangen Debi Chodin Milam Dabu, Jumadabu, Nyangen Debale, Lao Bichang. 
milam tabu, juma tabu, which means that nirvana is like a milam tabu, like a dream, like an illusion. Even if there's a something that is beyond, even there's a something that is greater than nirvana, that is also like an illusion and like a dream. So when the Buddhists talk about a reincarnation, it's only talking during the relative truth, right? But the thing is, I think, you know, this is just my guess. I think many in the West or the modern people, uh, the moment they talk about reincarnation, I think they think in terms of having a soul that actually truly exists, which then transmigrate from one body to another body. By the time you analyze like that, Buddhists don't even believe in a soul. So things like, okay, so the question like, but you know, I still don't believe that one day I'll become a horse. <laughs> you understand? Now, this is where you see, see the moment you analyze, I don't know how to say this, if the students can actually explore writings of Gideon Chapel, I think it will really help. He is really good, he's quite sharp. There is, um, you see, relative truth, especially according to Chandrakirti, is like, you don't want to, there is a certain analytical system to analyze uh, the relative truth, but that cannot be Analytic, uh, analyzing method to analyze the ultimate truth. You know what I mean? Like you can, you can analyze whether the coffee bean is from Kenya or, Go uh, or Guatemala. But the moment you analyze what is coffee bean and then you chop the coffee bean and try to see, then you will not see coffee bean. But for somebody who likes to drink a coffee and who likes the illusion of sipping the coffee, smelling the coffee. Yeah, you can talk about Guatemala coffee, coffee uh, without, uh, with not too much water, then is you label it as a um, Americano with a less water, espresso, all that is possible. It's all that is accepted. So on that level, I think the Buddhist reincarnation is uh, studied. So, this is why I'm trying to bring the sort of two things, which is study of Buddhist history, how Buddhism traveled to the West. And the other one is a philology, right? The word, the language. So my question actually is, is there a, some sort of um, attention to this? Uh, that's also a big question, I think. <laughs> when, when you talk about history, the history of Buddhism coming to the West, you make me think of um, the scholarship of Donald Lopez, like his book, Curators of the Buddha, um, analyzing the um, imperialist and colonial ideas that say British, um, British people who were in India had about the people they were encountering. Um, and so these projections of Christian values and also values that had to do with domination, how the, this plays in to the backdrop of how we understand Buddhism. I think that legacy lives on in academia today. What an important, that that is an important thing to know, I feel. Donald's that I think so important. I think we're still really thinking about that and trying to undo that or trying to shine analysis on it in order to see it as the coffee bean once you dissect it and it falls apart, you know, where there's a process going on. Would anybody right. else add to it? But ironically, you know, ironically, you know, even though I am, I'm asking, is there a stu study of Buddhist history? Ironically, I think, I think it is safe to say that the West is much more history centric. I think the Western culture has, is very into in the beginning, sort of the 
the manufacturing date. When did it happen? So the culture of, you know, like evolution, genesis, Big Bang, how did it all start? It's a very Western culture, isn't it? I'm not saying this is negative. I think it's, that's how the Western think. Now, if you move to the East and especially India, and based especially with the Hind Advaita Hindu, for instance, or a Buddhism, past is gone, future has not arrived, those two are not important. All you have is this now, present moment. And then, you know, India, you know, Indians are the, Indians have never managed to properly put, you know, record like how the Chinese have done or the, how the Westerners have done. They've never carved on, you know, like, you know, keeping record of what happened in the past was never an issue. And this, by the way, actually permits even to me, for instance, like when I grow up, um, like uh, when I grow up, um, when I was studying, um, you know, never taught much about history. It's almost like it's a waste of time to study these things. So the culture is not there. So then not only culture, I mean, the history, studying uh, the history culture, it's, um, I don't know what to say. It's like very, it's a culture that really, uh, you know, talks about how this moment thing. And so therefore uh, the myth, legend and the reality are very, very closely linked. And um, I was reading a Hindu guru's biography and uh, as I was reading, it's almost like a biography of the many of our Tibetan gurus, you know, so-and-so appeared and then, you know, like so-and-so lived 500 years. It would be very difficult for Western or modern minded people to accept. But I think if the students can actually uh, be more receptive, about the culture that really does not. Um, I mean, Indian culture is a very, very paradoxical and we really don't know like what is good today is next day is not a good thing. You know, it's very, very like, I mean, like all the myriad of gods that you see in India, today one God is the most important. Tomorrow, that same God is a retinue God, you know, like that. So this is where, you know, this is where the things like this exist. I think the students, if the students can be aware of that, probably it will help, help appreciate some of these sort of nuances and the, I don't know. Rinpoche, if I might ask you a question related to this. So I study Guru Rinpoche, and, in, and so my question is about those of us who are scholars and also practitioners of the tradition and this relationship between myth and legend and history that you're pulling out. So how do we as scholar practitioners approach? So there's very little historical evidence that Guru Rinpoche was like an actual person that came from India, um, but mm. of huge significance um, yes. in pioneering the tradition. And so how would you recommend that we approach subjects like that as practitioners scholars? Yes, just before I was saying, if you can understand, where, you know, okay, so Guru Rinpoche is born in the lotus, right? How ridiculous is that now for the modern people? This is like, so it's like a really like a fairy, fairy tale. It's like in the department of Cinderella and all that kind of thing. But, you know, then again, you look at the liturgy and the the world of Guru Rinpoche, if you look into that, and by the way, there's uh, many great masters such as Zelen Nato Rangdol, who actually argues that Guru Rinpoche is actually like a normal human being, you know, born from the womb, and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, and by the way, even in Tibet, 
there were a lot of new translation people who laughed at the Nyingmapas, who are the followers of Guru Rinpoche. You know, you are Guru Rinpoche born in the lotus. You know, how ridiculous is that? They said this. And as an answer to that, the Nyingmapas also uh, tell, well, you know, Buddha Shakyamuni is supposedly born from the what? The right side of the, <laughs> what is, what, you know, there's this kind of story. So this is what I mean. This is, these are the things that you hear from lands like India. Another thing maybe the students should do is should, you should also go to India before it has, it has too much, you know, rationalism. At the moment, there's a still a little bit of, I would not say irrational, I'm sure there's a lot of that, but, you know, things that does not really make sense, but at the same time, it is very powerful. Things like this still exist. And I think that's really important. I think this is something that we should not lose it. Because rationalism, logic, empiricism, I think it really deprives us from a lot of this richness. Anyway, going back to Guru Rinpoche, now if you look at the Guru Rinpoche's world, the lotus really symbolizes the devotion. And this connects very well with, uh, you know, even Shakyamuni Buddha said, you know, you know, like if there is a devotion, there is a Buddha. You know, the Buddha is a basically a projection and this connects very well with the Buddhist view. For instance, if I see, if I'm looking at somebody and if I don't like this person, I see him as a nasty, terrible person and that's my projection. Just like that, if I am, uh, you know, if I'm looking at somebody as a savior, I don't know, a saint, whatever, like a guru Rinpoche, it's a projection coming from your mind. And yeah, this is another thing. A um, lot of these teachings are you, you know, taught using symbol, um, poetic language. Um, you know, I'm sure you have read this, uh, you know, in the Hindu Tantra, I think it's in the Kashmiri Tantra, Shiva Tantra. It's a very beautiful, uh, epi you know, there's a small episode where uh, I think Parvati uh, asked Shiva, please teach me Tantra. And uh, tan uh, t Shiva said, well, when after many requests, Shiva said, well, then you and I have to be in union and in love. The reason is when you are in love, no logic. You know, this, this much we know, right? When we fall in love, we, we, we have no logic. People who we can't possibly love, we love. And then their smell is the best, their appearance is the best. All logic goes out of the window. Even the most ardent uh, logicians, critical thinking people, scientists, I'm sure when they fall in love, every logic goes out of the window. So Shiva's comment, I mean, statement, I think is very profound. Like, Logic and rationalism is the obstacle to understand the profound teachings such as the Tantra. You know, so in this context, if you can appreciate the Guru Rinpoche, and after all, there is not a single teachings that is related to Guru Rinpoche that does not say that you and the Guru Rinpoche are, is one. Even in practice, let's say if you are doing a sadhana of Guru Rinpoche, Guru Rinpoche dissolves into you or you dissolve into Guru Rinpoche and in that inseparability, you try to do this and that. What does this say? You know, it's really not like some sort of an almighty, truly existing, externally existing Guru Rinpoche who was born so-and-so date, you know. So these are teachings of non-duality, trying to articulate with the dualistic words. What can you expect? You know, this is probably the only way. Thank you so much.
and, and I would like to open the floor to any other people that may have questions or responses. Um, Kembo Yeshi, I see you raising your hand. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, uh, confused uh, with following this so much uh, threats to, to to remember back to the beginning from your speech. But uh, somehow, Rinpoche, you mentioned that this Western academic way of tracing back the history in the West, how Buddha Dharma comes, and also if we talk about uh, our Kumba Cuba real conduct med uh, meditation mm -hmm. and so forth. The real is important. And from there, the truth is need to understand if I uh, correctly. Yes. But then, then it comes to the history, then East and West history are different. And uh, then, here, the richness of this myth and legend and uh, Guru Rinpoche and so forth, or biography and hagiography, that we, seems Rinpoche is saying that we can, we should not eliminate that part, we should cherish that part. And how mm -hmm. sort of uh, search truth history with this uh, fantastic kind of uh, history that we we cherish. How we can reconcile these two? I think what I'm. I think what I'm hoping is if the student. I don't know. It's a very maybe. It's a very big asking, because especially you know I know the modern education system really cherishes you know logic and empiricism, right? But I think if there is a way, okay, so if you go to, I don't know, like if you go to another, you know, planet, right, where, I don't know, like shaking hand is not a right thing to do, then you will need to really understand that and appreciate that and learn that and you know, try to refrain shaking hands, so to speak, right? And um, especially uh, that, you know, India and I think China, uh, it has, these two countries has, probably there's a few other more, had almost 2000 years, probably more of history of really uh, dealing with, studying written books regarding the observer, the, the mind. Uh, so in other words, probably things like Genesis, like evolution, this is not something that they were too impressed with, so to speak. And this is something that if the modern students can appreciate, okay, so these guys don't, you know, okay, so if I'm reading, so this is what I'm saying. So um, like um, Guru Rinpoche, for instance, uh, Guru Rinpoche never died, right? Now, what does that mean? Is it just a story? Or is it coming from a culture and a tradition that really talks about, you know, the non-duality of death and uh, birth? Now, if you can maybe uh, sort of see that aspect, then I think uh, the, the, generally the students who study, the Asian study, and especially the you know Hindu or the Buddhist studies, I think they can get a lot from uh, this kind of analogy and examples. And I don't know. I mean, like even looking at a painting, I always say this: like if you are looking at a painting of a deity, 
and this is actually coming from Gedun Chapel, a deity is sitting on a lotus. How come the lotus is not squished and flattened? And this tells us that this is a culture that really, this comes from a culture or the philosophy, or I don't know, it comes from people who don't make too much, I don't know, not only not pay too much attention, sometimes even detest. You know, like I said, oh, you know, this is a waste of time talking about this. This is how I grew up myself. Okay. And uh, yes, uh, lately I'm reading the Magnetic uh, Hard Essence of the Malamitra, and there emphasizes the Loju, which is uh, kind of generating students' confidence or faith. Yes. Loju is the purpose of the generating faith. Yes. So it's not. Uh, not other way what uh, Westerners analyze it. And also, yes. in the West, uh, I think they believe that uh, Muhammad and Jesus are also born without father. So it's not miracle uh, birth. So, so it's right, not right. Uh, totally uh, right. without miracles. Yes. Um, now, if Christianity talks about, you know, the, you know, if they can talk about the shunyata, then I think you can talk about as many myths as possible. Magic, myth, all of this. I mean, this is how I would argue, you know. So anyway, coming back to your loju history. Yes, you are right. Even though, I mean, what I'm, what I was saying is, uh, I was, uh, I was sort of generally comparing between uh, the West and the East regarding how much emphasis is put on the history and the recording, record of you know stuff like this. Okay, let's talk about a uh, loju. So, for instance, like a bimanyingtik or any kind of a tantra. Uh, and actually, even the sutra, uh, the very big, uh, you know, like uh, statement is like, um, what is it? Maha, mm, uh, what is Mahamaya? Or, mm, I mean, um, what is it? No, no, not Mahamaya. Evam Maya. Evam Maya. Now, loosely translating, thus, uh, thus have I heard. So, thus have I heard. Now that is a sort of a history, isn't it? Because once when Buddha was in Vulture's Peak, you know, at that time. So usually when we talk about a loji or a history, we talk about five things. The teacher, the teaching, the time, uh, what is it? Uh, the, the disciple, right? So we talk about the five aspects. Now it right. is interesting. La? A place, nay. Place, nay. But it is very interesting. As we talk more and more history, then as you know, you know, like when we really go deeper and further and further, then what do we say? Tempa Chujiku, Buddha Dharmakaya. Where is he? He has no form, he has no mouth, nothing. Two, what did he teach? Sindhu Mevagi, no words, no language. To whom did he teach? His own reflection. When did he teach? All the time. Where did he teach? Everywhere. So this is how, this is, this is what we end up hearing. And um, just to give us more example, even in Hinduism, you know, like if you are reading something like a, a Vishnu or a Shiva, they say they're very, very similar, actually. They say that even you and I talking right this very moment is a dream of Vishnu. Nothing else. 
So I think these are really very, very wealthy wealth. It's a, such a wealth that us students like you and me, we can really enjoy and really expand and crack our head. Otherwise, we get too imprisoned by uh, some sort of a, you know, like a ta, we call it in Tibetan, ta is some sort of a boundary, you know, a box. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't know whether I'm ever making any sense, but I was telling Nishita, this, all the questions that I have received is something that really requires a lot of talking, but I guess that's what we are doing. I, hopefully I'm answering some of your question. Uh, um, so my question is that Rinpoche, do you feel that a historical and a cultural analysis about Buddhism can benefit the Buddhist communities? How can it best do that? Well, as I've been repeating, I think it really will help um, because um, um, because culture, when we talk, okay, history, when we talk about history, we are talking about a story, uh, you know, like a people's, uh, what happened to people, how they migrated and that, how they ate, how they drank, how they ruled that also. But more importantly, uh, we will be talking about things like language, isn't it? And the language, wow, that is one really, because I have, I never even realized this myself, uh, you know, in the past until recently when I'm, doing this uh, 84,000 Kanjuru translation, it's like mind boggling. So, I mean, the very Tibetan language itself is changing now, evolving. So a lot of the things that, uh, you know, the words, the Tibetan language nowadays, and it's very interesting, by the way, youngsters like you, for instance, I don't know where you come from, where you studied, but anyway, um, youngsters, those who grow up in India, those who have studied in Kalimpong, those who studied in Musuri, they when they speak, and when, even though they're using the Tibetan language, they are meaning English because they have read things like Jane Austen. They have in their head, Charles Dickens, they have, you know, Jane Austen, you understand? So they speak, that's what they're meaning, you know? Now, this is a very interesting. Now we have a young generation coming from Tibet, from China. Those who have gone through the Chinese universities and Chinese training, they have a different sort of interpretation of the words. So it's, I guess this is, uh, I mean, inevitable. This is something that we need to be aware of, I think. Um, and definitely to study, you, you know, like um, Buddhism. I always say that if I'm like the Kim Jong-un of Buddhism, I will ban words like enlightenment. I will ban words like compassion. I will ban words like a meditation. They are not only not uh, bringing the real meaning of uh, gom, ningje, tarva. They are actually distorting it. And um, but what can we do? We have to use a language, right? So this is where people like you guys, you guys can maybe you know, really stir these things. You, you guys can maybe, and this is why, why, what you guys are doing there, such an important task, job. Um, so I noticed that Pema has their hand up. So I'm gonna switch over to Pema, but I also just wanted to say Rinpoche that 
um, you're emphasizing language a lot, and you are also speaking to some Tibetans that come from the Chinese system, as you just described, and you're speaking to some Tibetans who have been educated more in India. So both of those communities are listening to you <clears throat> now. And um, I'm just wondering, as you're reflecting on the Project 84,000 and how important language is, what should we be doing to preserve and respect the Tibetan language? Is it the art of translation that should, we should be teaching classes on and focusing on? Um, is it a kind of, so if enlightenment and compassion are not the right words, do we then seek to popularize the meaning of Tarpa and Ningje? How do we, how do we, what should we focus on? And then Pema, oh after I, you, you're next. Ah, oh, wow, that's difficult. I can only tell you that those are not doing that job, but um, I think um, at least this much information that they are not doing the justice, they are not doing the correct translation. I think just to know that is already quite good, I would say, but substitute words, I really don't know. Wow. This is difficult. I mean, I coin, I toss around, I like words like awakening, for instance, like a tarva, seeing the truth, those are good. But then, you know, you also have to inspire people. This is why I really, you know, I really, I should say, it's like I'm even more impressed with the Buddhist uh, teaching of Changdun and Ngedun, you know, like um, expedient teaching and the direct teaching. I think, I guess this is why it existed like that. Um, I'm only here to just bring this up. I don't know the, what is the right word. This is something that hopefully you guys can come up with. <laughs> you know, hopefully you guys can. And, you know, actually there's some questions regarding um, uh, the practice, you know, how important the practice is. And I think, yes, this is where, um, I think uh, practitioner, but then, you know, the word practice, practice, especially within the Buddhist context, is very soiled. This word is very contaminated. I think the word practice is immediately referring to the Buddhist as something to do with the sitting, something to do with the like counting mantras, something to do with like, I don't know, reading a sadhana or a prostrations or a making offerings. Drupa, mm. sadhana, you know, it's not really that, is it? It's really, really, like getting acquainted to the view. I mean, okay, so somebody says that, okay, all compounded things are impermanent. Now my practice is really to establish this in my heart, in my system, in my emotion, so that when I say goodbye to you today, if I have a, this sort of pang of sadness, the, like, this may be it. This may be my last time seeing you guys here. That's what I call practice of the, you know, impermanence. But then, you know, now chanting, oh, the, everything is impermanence, everything is impermanence, 100,000 times is considered practice. So it has degenerated a lot. Uh, hello, Tashi Delay. Um, I, uh, so um, earlier when you were talking about, about, um, about philosophy, I guess. So my, my question often in Buddhist studies has been about what I think that there's, there's, there's these obstacles that come from the Western category of philosophy, just as there are these obstacles maybe that come from religion. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that 
you know, it's like we can think in philosophy that we, we intellectually know something and understand something. And it's very easy, even for, 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 for philosophers, like when you're in that, that English category of philosophy to say, oh, I understand emptiness. I know, I know about this. Like that makes sense to me. Um, and yeah, so I guess I just, I would be curious if you have any thoughts about, about how to get past that kind of that intellectual the limits of that intellectual knowing even in an academic context to let students know what you were just saying about how you take it you take it into your heart it has to become it it pervades everything um yeah if, yeah if you are sense. talking about gum isn't it you are talking about what we call practice yes that's the difficult one isn't it yes it is I, you know, just again, um, I think, I don't know so much, but uh, I think in the West, the rationalism, somehow they stopped there, I feel. And then they got so, you know, like, wow, rationalism, you know? I think they, they got stopped there. And I, I wish they go beyond that. Of course, irrationalism, paganism, you know, all those things are okay, okay, you know, there's, they're, they're, you know, rubbish, whatever. Then rationalism, fantastic, but let's go beyond that. So if there is a little bit of that, you know, like longing, because, you know, rationalism at the same, at the end of the day, if, if the, you know, if you really think about it, it's a really, really, sophisticated way of making yourself an idiot, basically. Because it's really limiting, you know, it's like you have become a slave of a, some sort of a yardstick. So you need to really have that kind of longing. And that can come anywhere. And it has come to you. I mean, it, it, it does come to, I mean, I'm not encouraging this, but you know, like, why do, we, why do people drink? Why do people take drugs? Because, you know, you feel really good when you don't, okay, normally I wouldn't walk around naked, but because I feel shy, because I don't like to show my, I don't know, ugly knees, but hey, tonight, who cares? And I like that, you know, like sometimes go, get out of that sort of a prison, you know? So I think if that kind of a longing, I think this is what, and if, you know, sometimes in the Dharma, they talk about disciple of superior faculties. This is it. This is one of the most important ingredient, like wanting to really just shrug off from this, all this logic and, you know, whatever, you understand. Um, I would say like, if you are studying something like a Tsema, a Buddhist uh, Pramana, there is a, they, they have a four different Pramana, logic or a cognition, direct cognition or a valid, uh, cognition is not the right word, maybe, uh, what is it, the, the way they validate, the way they validate. Uh, if you study this a little bit, probably it may also help because uh, the Buddhists would say, especially the Brahmana people will say that all other three are kind of a valid, but not really a valid. So they are like things like your eyes, like my eye, eyes are now looking at your picture. This is Unsum Tsema. You know, it's like direct cognition. That's valid. You are there, I'm here, you know. You know, th and then inferential, you know, like in inferring, oh, there's a smoke, so there must be a fire. It happened because of in the past, so on and so forth. So anyway, there's all that tema. Now in the pram Brahmana, they said that the real tema is Nanjur Munsum, the yogis, yogis, you know, experience that but you know to whom should we say this you know people who think that we have gone crazy right but the yogis 
way of seeing things, uncontaminated by logic, unbound and crippled by rationalism, and you know, just so open. You know, this is what I think um, we need to sort of market this a little bit, I guess. Okay. So my question is, so Chen State Foundation has been pivotal for spreading Dharma in the academic field in the US. So what's your, um, and, uh, what's your motivation for creating endowed professors in the universities in the US? And what's your vision for the future? Um, wow, well, okay. As I said right at the beginning, um, you know, the sum gomsum. So, it, starting with the the sum, it can never go wrong. I think lack of the sum is always a problem. Now, place like Tibet, we have been blessed. You know, there's a there's a little bit of a irony here. Um, yes, state should never be involved with the religion because it, it does have a lot of downfall. But the thing is, state sponsorship also brings us some good things. For instance, like in Tibet, like Songsen Gambo, Tisong Dilsen, Tri Rabachan, they sponsored, right? So when Buddha Dharma came from India to Tibet, even Guru Rinpoche suffered, even Bhimalamita suffered. You know, there are people like, hey, this is a Hindu black magic. Who is this, you know, Guru Rinpoche? Who is this? You know, there were, you know, people like Berotana suffered a lot. He was banished. So there was a lot of scrutiny. So that really established a quite a strong root of Tibetan Buddhist study, uh, Buddhist study in Tibet. But now, in the modern world, especially in, in the West, like in Europe, in America, Buddhism sort of really spread it haphazard. Beatles, I don't know, John Lennon, uh, I forgot some of the, you know, Jai Guru Deva, all that songs, drugs. They're all good, by the way, they're all very good. I, I you know, I think they're all bodhisattvas in country. As a Buddhist, I would say that. Uh, Vietnam War, and then all those hippies who get, went to Nepal in search for some sort of ecstasy, but bump into great masters. But then, you know, we, the Lamas, we have never really offered these people systematic sort of study. So I think I just feel that the Lamas, like myself, we have really, I mean, maybe like 30, 40 years behind. We should have done this way before when, um, because I don't know how much of this interest in Buddhism will remain, you know, especially in the West, trend is so fast, so fast. And, um, uh, and sometimes the trend are quite uh, scary. For instance, now, I think in the West, there's a, some sort of a romantic and uh, excitement about meditation, about mindfulness. And this worries me too, because, you know, no academic studies, no UMA, no tsema, no non-duality, you know, just sitting on the meditation, then it's, it's going to really water down, water down too much. And then I think this is where I feel that guardian of Buddhism in the West will be the academics, at least for now. I'm, I'm speaking as a Buddhist. Um, in closing, we would like to ask you uh, two things. One is that what can early PhD scholars avoid any pitfalls? And secondly, for us as a group uh, for this lecture series, are there any things that we should focus on or any goals that we should keep in mind? Oh, this is, I don't know. 
what you can do. But uh, as I have sometimes teased you, and which I will do this also with the other students, I think it would be good if, uh, especially if there are students here who, who are studying Tibetan Buddhism, I think you should also study about the downfall or the flaw of the Tibetan uh, politics in the past. I'm talking about how lamas were corrupted and all of that. I think that's good to, to actually have a proper objective analytical study because I'm not asking you to do this for, uh, you know, any other reason than, you know, because that also ha has an impact on how you study Buddhism. You, it, it does, because many, many times, Tibetan Buddhist, when the Tibetan Lama, especially when we teach Buddhism, we end up teaching the Tibetan Zim, so to speak, Tibetan culture. And, and unless you are doing a Tibetology, you know, if, unless you are doing a PhD on Tibetan culture related Buddhism, if you really want to study Buddhism, then oftentimes the Tibetan culture get, can get into the way. But so at least if uh, the students can sort of differentiate between, you know, like uh, the Tibetan culture and the Dharma, that could really help for the future um, practitioners, students, whatever. That's, that's about all I can think of at the moment. Rinpoche, thank you so much for your time and your generosity and your wisdom and sharing with us. It has really been an incredible honor to gain wisdom from you. Thank you. I, I hope that we will have another opportunity to invite you back. I feel like we've only just begun. Um, and if I'm reading the room right here, we actually have a million other questions we would love to talk with you about, but we're aware of the late hour in Taiwan. Um, so may this be the beginning and not the end. Thank you. Yes, I'm very looking forward to see you again. Uh, well, I'm really, really honored to speak to all of you. And um, your questions are really important, very big. Um, I hope at least I managed to sort of, uh, you know, create more questions in your head. I definitely, I can't, um, I didn't have any intention of actually managing to answer it, but uh, these are very important questions. Um, hope to see you. Please take care. Uh, wash your hands, social distance, all of that, uh, I think um, is important. Uh, and uh, especially the Buddhist uh, students, as I said earlier, um, I really believe that um, those who have done hearing and especially hearing and contemplation, uh, they will be, if they're there, they will be always a bit of a nag, so what do you call it? People who are nagging, people who make noise because there have been a lot of charlatans, you know, those who are, you know, this, that, you know, like mindfulness, this, mindfulness, that. We need a little bit of people who, oh, you know, what do you think, you know, this, all that, people who nag, people who make noise, basically. And I think that's important for Buddhism, that noise makers. So I hope all of you become good noise makers.